like to welcome everyone. Uh, our church, we did every year we do fest festival. This back festival a few months ago. It's working this one or no? Yeah. Uh, we have actually uh, Faro City downstairs that really attracts a lot of people. This is when I met uh, Irini and she was explaining to me a lot of stories about ancient Egyptian, different than the one I'm accustomed to. So this is when I told her, I rather everyone else can hear it, not only me. So we came with this idea to have one day to do a seminar for one hour or so in order to all of you enjoy this. So I'm pretty sure you are going to like it. At least this is the first time we'll see how it can go. So it should be good, obvious. So let me introduce Irene Shinoda and have her, you know, give you all what you need to do. Uh, oh. uh, good afternoon, everyone. I would like to welcome all of you to the lecture. Uh, about myself, uh, my name is Irini. I am archaeologist. Um, graduated from the School of Archaeology in Cairo University. Um, I have also an MBA from the Johnson and Wales University here from the United States, and I've worked as the Egyptian Museums uh, Museum in Cairo for years. Um, uh, through my job at the museum, I was also able to go everywhere and have a deep connection with the Egyptian antiquity uh, in north, east, south, west. Uh, until the border of Sudan. So um, uh, today we're going to focus on the old kingdom and, the, and its influence on the Egyptian, ancient Egyptian civilization. Um, before we start, I, I want to give you a quick idea about the ancient Egyptian timeline. We have three big kingdoms, the old kingdom, the middle kingdom, and the new kingdom. Uh, everybody heard about the mosque of King Tot, uh, the King Ramses II and his great temple Abu Simbel, uh, also Queen Nefertiti, and they all lived in the time of the new kingdom. Uh, Here is the new king. Um, sorry, the new kingdom. But today we're gonna have a break of the new kingdom, and we're gonna focus on something else. The Old Kingdom. The Old Kingdom started 2700 BC and ended 2200 BC. Let's make it easier for you. It was 5,000 years ago when the Egyptian Empire started. Uh, remember, it is the Old Kingdom. And before the Old Kingdom, there was a period which we call it the, the pre-dynastic pre period. Um, Before, through the old kingdom, each king and queens has a tomb. And this tomb was very, very easy, very simple, nothing complicated. Consists of a deep shift, and at the end, underground level is a normal uh, burial chamber. And this burial chamber contains the skeleton of the pharaoh, or the skeleton of the queen. But When time passes, people get more mature and they want to add more uh, stuff inside the tomb. And it had an, a rectangular shape like this. We call it the rectangular shape or the mastaba. Mastaba means, it's an Arabic word of bench. So a mastaba made of mud brick. And the mud brick people used at that time for hundreds of years, almost seven years. Nothing changed, always using the same type of structure, but there must be something happened. And here we're going to listen to this video, which is an introductory, introductory for the lecture. Thank you. 
Greece and Rome were but a distant dream. One civilization conceived the impossible and built the unimaginable. The Egyptians worked on a much grander scale than anyone did for millennia. Enriched by their conquests and empowered by their gods, the indomitable pharaohs of Egypt built the ancient world's first stone monolith. Its tallest building, oldest dam, most impenetrable fortress, greatest city, and the ultimate monument to one ruler's ego. It's a clear message. Do not mess with Egypt. Egypt's engineers boldly redefined the limits of architectural possibility. But their road to eternal glory was riddled with blood, betrayal, and outright disaster. Today, the pyramids still stand as the ancient world's main attraction, but they were no overnight success. It took six pharaohs, four generations of builders, and numerous engineering disasters to achieve such perfect proportions. The pyramid builders began their quest for architectural perfection at a place called Saqqara. It was there in the year 2667 BC that an enterprising young pharaoh named Djoser claimed the throne and commissioned the world's very first stone superstructure. His tomb project would solidify Egypt's standing as the world's most advanced civilization and propel his pioneering architect into the pantheon of the gods. Twenty six sixty seven BC. In Egypt, a new king is crowned. He is Djoser, the second ruler of Egypt's Old Kingdom period. Djoser would establish a reputation as a wise and pious ruler. Even 2,000 years after his death, he would remain the model Egypt's later pharaohs sought to emulate. During his reign, he was so popular that he ceased being a mere mortal in the minds of his subjects and became the first of Egypt's pharaohs to be deified as a god. So, the history started when King Djoser became the establisher of the Old Kingdom. King Djoser's significant impact on the Egyptian civilization is unforgettable. His nomination for the history remained forever, and we're gonna still talk about him for centuries and centuries. King Djoser is the founder of the Old Kingdom, and we're gonna know within the next lecture what did he do. So King Djoser is starting building a city, his capital, where his palace located in Memphis. Here it is. Normally, people come to Giza or visit Giza, where the great pyramids of Giza, uh, uh, the pyramid of Cheops, Kephren, and Mykerinos. But nobody, actually maybe a few people, travel to Saqqara and Memphis. Memphis is the capital of King Djoser, the founder of the Old Kingdom. And he chose, on the other side of the Nile, Saqqara. And here, you come to a closer map. Here is Memphis, and here is Saqqara. Not so far from the pyramid of Giza. It's actually about 15 miles to the south of Giza. Saqqara, where the history started. Now, we talked before about the two construction of the tomb, the mastaba, the bench or the mud brick construction. That's what happened as well with King Zoser. King Zoser developed a unique structure underground. Consists of a shaft, consists of a shaft very deep underground. And around this shaft he made unbelievable huge maze. This maze contains a lot of rooms, storage rooms for everything the king needs in his journey to the afterlife. And the more bigger the maze is, the more it is sophisticated for the robbers to enter his burial chamber. 
His burial chamber must be sealed and must be secured forever because he needs his burial chamber. Where is the sarcophagus located? Where is his mummy inside? His mummy should be secured forever. That's why at that time, 5,000 years ago, it was the huge underground level ever exists. On top of the underground level, King Djoser used the mastaba, the rectangular shape we already saw before, but here he didn't use mud brick as the previous pharaohs used before. He used for the first time limestone because, you know, mud brick is easy to break. It will not last forever. They were always searching for something very sturdy, very strong, that will last for the journey of the eternal, eternal life. And that's what he did. He made the rectangular shape. He used for the first time limestone. And then he was trying, uh, is it really sturdy enough? Can I make it bigger and bigger? He was trying and he, was well, he, was, he succeeded to do that. He made first extension on this side and from the other side he made a second extension but pay attention he didn't stop there he made another a second mastaba or a second bench made of limestone first time in history and then third bench fourth fifth sixth and it became the first pyramid ever exist in history, made not any more of mud brick, but made of limestone. And we're gonna see now, this is a map of the underground level, the maze, the huge maze, that discouraged the robbers to get inside and rob his sarcophagus, his mummy. It's already robbed, but here is actually the oldest uh, alabaster, Marmar sarcophagus ever exist. It's 5,000 years old and it's still well preserved. And here is the upper level. We see here a successful pyramid, not only one bench or one story, but 60 stories high. It's 61 meter high or um, um, feet. Okay, so 61 meter high, consists of uh, uh, six stories. And um, at that time, this was a unique structure. This was astonishing, distinguishing structure, never exist before. Actually, the king wanted to go faster to the afterlife. I, he used these stairs to start his journey. He, went, he wanted to go faster. And based on religious text, this is actually the stairway to heaven. Not only building a pyramid, but also at the bottom of the pyramid, he had a smooth casting. So the whole pyramid was gleamy white, was covered with a smooth stone. And you see it here on the basis. And imagine now the sun rays reflect on this magnificent pyramid and always repeating that it is 5,000 years old. So the reflection of the sun rays reflected uh, on the pyramid at that time. King Djoser and his great architect Imhotep did not stop there. He was so ambitious and he added more temples, more tombs inside the funerary complex. Now, it's not only a pyramid, but we had many, many tombs inside this funerary complex. One of them is the southern tomb. We talked about the underground maze. Where is the sarcophagus? Where is the mummy of the pharaohs? But on the <clears throat> on the southern side, so the pyramids are always located in, uh, on the north, and here exactly on the southern side of the complex 
located the Southern Tomb. Here it is. The Southern Tomb consists of 92 feet uh, shaft, very deep, and it has a small burial chamber at the end. But actually, this burial chamber is very, very small. It doesn't ever fit for the sarcophagus of the king. It fits, actually, as a resting, resting place for his soul, for his ka, or actually it could be something else. It is, uh, uh, archaeologists believed that this deep shift, which is 92 deep, uh, feet deep, is a, a secret tomb for his organs, for his canopen jars. Actually, during the mummification process, they took out the organs, the kidneys, the heart, um, the tummy, and they put it in small jars, we call it the canopen jars. And it might be one of his sacred tombs, either for his soul as a resting place, or either for his organs or the canopen jars, where 90 deep, 92 uh, feet deep underground. So we call it the Southern Tomb. King Joser was very ambitious. Finally, he found a strong, sturdy stone that he can depend on for his journey of the eternal life. Limestone for the first time. And that's why he was able to copy everything he has in his palace within the funerary complex. One of this important uh, courts that he should take, he wanted to take at that time, is the, is the Heb Set Court. The Heb Set Court is a, a festival that the king wanted to um, um, celebrate after reigning Egypt or ruling Egypt 30 years long. So he took a copy of this festival, the festival court, so that he will able to renew his kingdom in his reign in the eternal life. Actually, his focus always that he's going to have a spot in the afterlife. And it's not an ordinary spot. It is um, the spot of the pharaoh, of the rural. That's why the Hepset festival is something very, very important for the pharaoh. And in each temple, each tomb, there's always reliefs and there's always a scenes of the Hepset festival so that the king will be able to rule Egypt in his, in his eternal life. We see the scenes of the Hepset festival in Karnak temple, in Luxor temple. Everywhere you go, you must see it on the walls. So the first one who did that was Djoser, Djoser, the founder of the uh, old kingdom. We are still inside the funerary complex, and uh, the funerary complex had a surrounding wall, very, very big. It's uh, one mile long, and it has uh, 13 false doors, and one real door, which is the real entrance. And it is located on the southern side of the funerary complex. We see it here. Look at the first entrance ever exists in history. It is very well preserved. It's made of limestone. And it is um, three stories high. So it's about uh, three stories high. It's about 11 meter high. Very high, three stories high. And not only uh, made of limestone, it's also polished. It's very smooth from the outside, so that the sun gonna reflect on the entrance of the pharaoh. And here we are closer, you see? Very smooth, very soft, like soft skin. And if you stand there, it is so, so beautiful. You will never imagine that this construction is 5,000 years old. It is the old human mad, man-made structure in history and it is made of limestone. When you enter the complex, 
you got to find the first colony core hole ever exists. It is columns, and those pillars actually have uh, the, um, uh, the bundle of a stem plant. So it's kind of a bundle, stem plant connected all together. 32, 32. For the first time, people lived before that time had just a rectangular shape of mud brick and that's it. But look at the huge transition. When uh, ancient Egyptian people found out the limestone and found out that it is sturdy, we can use it for the eternal life, they had significant, uh, uh, um, significant uh, uh, use and uh, very sturdy and they were always trying, what we can we add more within this funerary complex? So this is the old columns ever, ever exist in history. And it's not ordinary columns, but it has the uh, stem of a plant. And they made a bundle of this uh, plant. Uh, within uh, the, the columns, we see niches. And in each niche, the king built a statue of the most famous gods and goddess. 24 statues of the most 24 gods and goddess within the niches, within the columns. When you end the hypostyle hole, there is eight pillars here, and the eight pillars, very beautiful, very well preserved, 5,000 years old. And it leads you to the southern court, the southern court of the uh, uh, funerary complex. I want to always imagine why, what is now the motive beyond uh, building such a pyramid? There must be a reason for that. The Pharaoh always thought that the sun god Ray will, will leave after the sun set, after the sun uh, uh, Sunset, yes. So the Pharaoh will accompany the sun after the sunset. And the Pharaoh was the offspring of the sun god Ray. And he wanted also to accompany the sun. And he wants to come back at the sunset every day. And the pyramid is the symbol of the sun god Ray. And the power of the pyramids is the mechanism of the circle, of the recycle, of the coming back, of the journey of the pharaoh every day. That's why the funerary complex is located on the west of the Nile. And his palace is located on the east of the Nile. And always the tomb of the king is located, oriented on the eastern side of the pyramid. All tombs. The, the, the pyramids of Giza, Kefrin, Cheops, uh, Minkaura, is always located and oriented underground or above ground on the east side. So that the king will wait every morning as the sun set and will accompany the, the sun in her, in, in her cycle for the eternal life. Here is the other side of the complex. We were here at the northern side, and here is the, uh, sorry, the southern side, and here is just a kind of a turn, and we came here, here, to the northern side. In the northern side, we have the entrance of the pyramid, and we have also this unique room. You see it here? Very little, at the bottom. Did, we, who, did you see this? Okay. Let's go. We have this unique room. This unique room, it, we call it the serdab. The serdab room. The cellar. And inside the serdab room, we have this unique statue. And the statue has holes. The wall has holes. Round holes. And if you look towards the two holes, it's actually you can see precisely 
the eyes of the Pharaoh. King Joseph the Great, looking at the northern stars and wishes to come back every day as the sun set. And he's also peeking through the two holes, looking at the uh, rituals that happening within its funerary complex. That's why they made the two holes. And the two holes within uh, uh, and, and, and the statue is something unique. Nobody uh, copy it and nobody did it after him. So the Serdab room is very unique. It has also the first uh, uh, life-sized statue ever exist. It is the first life-sized sculpture of a pharaoh. Before King Joseph, nothing. We had nothing. We had no pyramids. We had no tombs. We had no statues, nothing. But he is the founder of the old Egyptian empire. The first life-size statue ever exists, and we are so lucky that it's so well preserved, made of limestone. What in the, in the room is actually a replica, and we took the original one to the uh, old Egyptian museum in Cairo. Um, the first life-size statue, and maybe I repeat some words because I wanna focus on the importance of this incident. And it's, it's, uh, it's one meter 42 high, what, 142, 142, the height is 142 centimeter. And um, the king is sitting in a royal position. He is the pharaoh. He is the father of all of us. He is our grandfather. And he puts his arm, his right, uh, uh, his right hand arm on his chest, on his heart. And his eyes were inlaid with precious stone. Here. And there is also a remains of the colors on the statue. What is now the motive? Why? Why they made such, or they built such a, a statue next to the pyramid in this small, tiny room? There must be a motive. This is not for fun. This is something for, is very important. Now, under the pyramid lies always the burial chamber of the pharaoh. And inside the burial chamber, the sarcophagus. And inside the sarcophagus, the, the mummy of the pharaoh. And they always thought about maybe someone will go inside and rob and damage the mummy. That's why there must be something else that has the portrait of the pharaoh. And they thought that the statue is gonna be more and more sturdy enough so that the soul or the ka of the pharaoh gonna come back and gonna recognize its uh, 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 the pharaoh and they gonna come one together and once once the uh, unification happened they gonna start the journey of the afterlife that's why we have so many sculptures and that's why we have so many statues inside the tombs temples and that's why we have so many museums in Egypt and everywhere so this is uh, very important it is the first life-size statue ever, and this statue is 5,000 years old. Uh, who did this? Who built? It, King Joser didn't do anything by himself. He must have an architect, and this architect is Imhotep. Imhotep, his idea is to bring the limestone and use it to build the first pyramid. That's why people were, were always thinking about this genius man. He is the first genius man in history. He was not only an architect, he was also a physician. And therefore, the Egyptian government built a recent museum. This is only five, seven, five, five years old. 
Uh, when I left Egypt, we, we didn't have a museum for the architect Imhotep. So this is a new museum located in Saqqara, close to the funerary complex, and it is for the uh, 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 architect Imhotep. It's his uh, uh, statue is made of bronze, one of his statues. It is the entrance of the museum. Imhotep, the architect, Imhotep became a god. People worshipped Imhotep in Greece, and he became his legacy remained until 3,000 years after, because he is uh, the first genius man in history. He was a high priest. He was a scribe. He was a physician. And here is many statues of, uh, of Imhotep located inside, and he's very well known. That's why many uh, people come to visit his museum, such as uh, the Queen of Spain. I found her uh, picture online, so because he's very popular. Uh, King Djoser was very loyal to Imhotep, and what he did is writing his name on the footage of his sculpture. And not, it, we will never see it again. We always, the pharaoh is a pharaoh. We can't deny his name, his cartouche, everywhere. But writing a name of a common man on the footage of the sculpture of the pharaoh, we will never see it again. But King Djoser was so loyal to his first right-hand man, to his architect Imhotep or the god Imhotep. Um, here, um, not here, in the Egyptian Museum in Cairo. By the way, the Egyptian Museum in Cairo is uh, built, is the first museum uh, in history that's built to be a museum. If you compare uh, the Egyptian Museum to Louvre Museum, or uh, to uh, British Museum, they were old palaces, and they converted to uh, the museums. But this one is open, um, it took 10 years to build it, and it is, was opened at the year 1908. One of the architects that um, uh, was behind building the museum is the uh, famous late architect, uh, archaeologist, sorry, archaeologist, August Mariette. And he became a pasha. Uh, and he's buried in the front yard of the Egyptian Museum. So uh, uh, the Egyptian Museum in Cairo is full of thousands of pieces of the ancient Egyptian uh, antiquity. King Djoser's legacy remained until the present time because of his efforts, because of, of, he, uh, of uh, that he's, he is um, well known of the stone builder. And uh, maybe you visited the pyramids of Giza, the big, huge pyramids, but you never, might never visit the uh, uh, Saqqara complex. And now you got an idea about uh, the King Djoser, his efforts, the founder of the old kingdom, the founder of the old kingdom empire because of using the limestone. And you got now an idea about the architect Imhotep, the first genius man in history. Any questions? I think they come Uh, there is a next, uh, there is a second part uh, of this lecture. I don't know if you are uh, still interested. It talks about the ancient Egyptian art. So uh, I don't know if you want to stay or you want to do it uh, in a different time. Or you, so you, it's your choice. Fifteen minutes? Oh. Tab, we do it in a, in a different time? Or late?
Welcome.